This is Ed Rep Radio, presented by Eastman Music Company. This is Ed Rep Radio, a podcast to bring you ideas and information from industry experts you can use on the road every day. Presented by Eastman Music Company, and I'm your host, Shane Duell. Our topic today is on something that has been a massive disruptor in the school music industry, the supply chain. And it's not just the music industry. Everyone has experienced the frustrations of empty shelves, long waits for products, and unpredictable ETAs over the last couple years, from groceries to bikes and cars and lots of everyday needs. There have been countless news stories about the supply chain disruptions, backups at the ports, and truck driver shortages. But what does all of this mean for you as an ed rep? And what does it mean for your teachers who are asking, where's my order? And how long does it take to get this tuba? Our guest today is going to help us understand the supply chain crisis and how it came about and how you can help your teachers navigate these challenges. We are joined today by Ralph Torres, Director of Operations for Eastman Music Company, someone I've relied on regularly to help me with these same challenges for my customers. Ralph Torres, thank you so much for joining us today. Thanks for having me. So we're going to get into a really interesting, complex topic that honestly, most of us never really had to think about. It comes up in the news so often now, and that is the topic of the supply chain. And we didn't think we'd really have to be talking about this topic right now in February of 2022, but I feel like it would be really useful to give EdReps some useful information to give to their teachers, because I'm sure they're getting all sorts of questions from teachers of where's my order? Where's my stuff? What's happening? Uh, what's the ETA on this? So let's you and I kind of unpack this whole issue so that ed reps can talk to their teachers with some real knowledge about um, w- where it came from, where we are today, and maybe some, some ideas of what it's going to look like a month or a year from now. So before we do that, I always like to get into who you are as my guest and your background in music. Can you kind of walk us through your career? So I'm the director of operations for Eastman Music Company. Functionally, that kind of means I'm in charge of the supply chain for our business in a lot of ways. I uh, work out of the Pomona headquarters in California. I've been in my current position for seven years now, and I'm going on 13 years. No, this is 14 years with Eastman. All right. So... I've, I've been there not from the beginning at all, since this is our 30-year anniversary, but definitely from, uh, you know, kind of transitioning from from the smaller scale company, just getting into the winds when I started to where right. we are today. So it's been a pretty fun ride in many ways, and it's been pretty crazy and cre- pretty hectic. <laughs> right. It's changed a lot <laughs> since you started. Changed a lot. Yeah. When I started, it was Eastman and Haynes, and that was it. You know, now we have Shires, Bourgeois, Bakun, and, and, and our distribution facilities in Australia and Europe. So it's, it's really grown and it's been very fun to be a part of it. Uh, functionally, again, I, I kind of help manage and, and advise um, kind of my counterparts at, at the different facilities and manufacturing places, including our factories in China and, and work together to try in many ways, streamline our specific supply chain and, and turn that into, you know, product that gets delivered and the kid gets to play in school. Mm. Speaking of playing, I am a saxophonist. Uh, clarinet and flute are there because I had to learn doubles. Okay. I, I would not call myself <laughs> accomplished on either of those two instruments, but I'm, I'm primarily a saxophonist, primarily jazz, um, classically trained, went to school, uh, performance emphasis degrees, and a little bit of music technology, which I, you know, um, Kind of finished school, decided, hmm, what do I want to do now that I have my degrees that kind of mean nothing <laughs> in, the, in the world of being a performing musician. Right. Um, but yeah, it, that, that's, I say that kind of in jest. It does because in many ways, school is where you get to have the opportunity to play with other people where back in the day, in the 40s and, and stuff when jazz was being developed and you know, other types of music, you did that at the club. You know, mm-hmm. is a or a very different world today than it was then. So, I I kind of just stumbled on the job with Eastman. I got really lucky. I was just looking for a quote unquote day gig while I started to try and start my career. At that time, I was playing in 
half half a dozen different types of bands or salsa band swing band hmm. j- you know random jazz bands doing casuals and weddings and stuff like that i was teaching at an after school music program in actually one of the local school districts here taught lessons uh during and before and after i went to school i actually ended up with a studio of saxophone and clarinet and flute students of 40 students so i actually got to a point to where that that could have been a career path too there hmm. but I just stumbled on on an Eastman posting looking for kind of random jobs that I could do. And I got lucky, <laughs> to say the <laughs> least. Um, decided I really like this job. And I and, and early on, I before kids, I had time to gig. And I was really lucky and fortunate to work for Eastman. And um, even still today, we foster, you know, people's ability to, to play when, when it makes sense for us. You know, we're a business first, but second, we are a music company. So we have a lot of musicians that are employed here, which is a really cool thing. And we do what we can to let people still play. And that, that was definitely something I got to do uh, up until seven years ago when my first daughter was born. I played in a in a, in a relatively uh, locally known uh, swing band called Fat Cat Swinger. They're still doing really great stuff playing at Disneyland now. Great. But that was my main gig um, that I did while I was working at Eastman. Uh, started as customer service back in 2008. Hired on, um, you know, to do a lot of what our customer service does today. Obviously, different processes that I've kind of helped design along the way and change many, many times, as mm-hmm. I'm sure you could attest, Shane, mm-hmm. probably yep. just to frustration sometimes. But <laughs> it's all for the goal of progress, right, and improvement. Right. Being a saxophone player, we got some early saxophone samples. I s- stuck my nose in it, so to speak, right. and voiced my opinion on what those samples were like at the beginning. They were kind of random samples and. Luckily, um, the management at the time listened, and specifically Chen, our, our owner, um, he and I talked at length pretty early on about saxophone development and that I wanted to be a, a part of that. And that's that's what I did in conjunction with managing customer service eventually for a number of years. And that position eventually grew into what I'm doing now, which is director of operations. If I were to go back 20 years and tell Ralph in you know college that you would be a director of operations at a music company, would you be like, no way? I, I wouldn't have known what that meant. <laughs> uh, and I think that's what we all think of in, in, in a lot of respects, the people that have gone the, you know, the music school route mm-hmm. and, and turn and, you know, worked in the music instrument industry. Um, but yeah, one, one, I would have known what a director of music was. I definitely wouldn't have ever, ever heard of Eastman because it was just strings at that time. Right. And, um, and no, no. So no, the answer is no. <laughs> yeah. yeah, it's it's amazing. Uh, you know, I was talking to Corinne Smith about uh, flutes and, and her role, and she was saying the same thing. And I, same thing for me, you know, no one knew about the industry when we were going to school. And then here we are. It, right. And interestingly enough, I'm even I took a hiatus in school and then went back. And before I went back, I, I, you know, I was teaching lessons at a, at a local music store and it's not like I didn't, I mean, I, I would work the counter for a little bit too, even there. And, you know, the command rep came in. So it wasn't like I wasn't exposed to the concept that this business even existed. It's mm-hmm. just, and obviously I played the instruments. Mm-hmm. It's just, you don't realize as a musician, there's a business behind this. Right. And, and for <laughs> it's not that complicated to figure out, but you know, in hindsight, obviously, but when you're doing it, you're just like, Oh, play instruments. Of course they're just made by magic. <laughs> well, I think we'll dispel a lot of what that magic is discussing the supply chain. In this yeah. Conversation. Yeah. You know, I have to say coming from going to be a band director, going into retail from retail into manufacturing, that was one of the biggest eye opening things I experienced getting into the manufacturing side is how many things have to go right for an instrument to show up on a music store's shelf. It's right. really, there's a lot to it. So let's right. let's dig into it. Can you start with what does the supply chain normally look like in a non crazy COVID kind of situation? Let's go back a few years. What does that normally yeah. look like? Even then, it was still pretty hectic. Um, I think we could probably first even start even more basic than what supply chain means. Because okay. that word is getting thrown mm-hmm. around the world a lot for obvious reasons, the global supply chain crisis, supply chain, supply chain, supply chain. Yeah. It, it's, I mean, it's, it's not even a chain, it's a circle. And I think that's one piece that gets missed in, hmm. in some of the way this is reporting or, or discussed. Okay. The supply chain is all the steps that are necessary for raw materials 
to be converted into the various parts and sub-assemblies that turn into the product that then has to get shipped somewhere. And then depending on the method of sale, it either goes to a, you know a, a warehouse distribution to the final user, or it could go to a warehouse distribution to a retail environment to the final user. But it's all those steps and things that are necessary, again, to, send, to turn raw material into the final product and into the hands of the person that's going to use it. Okay. And I say it's a circle because... There's so many steps within that supply chain that just relate back to resources that may be at step six that need to go back to step two to make its way back. So there's a lot of different like mini supply chains and processes within each one of those major steps that needs to happen. And that's mm-hmm. where we're what we're seeing the problems today. Uh, so to, to answer your question about what a normal supply chain looks like, it has predictability. And that is a big piece that is broken in today's current supply chain. I, I just listened. I listen to books because I don't get to read. <laughs> being, a, being a father of three, you know, two twin toddlers and a seven-year-old, so I don't Ooh. get to read at home. So I use my commute into work to, to listen to books. Audible is awesome. Mm-hmm. Um, it is. I, I just listened to one, and, and podcasts like this are awesome as well. I just listened to one called Arriving Today. It came out pretty recent. I think he's a Wall Street Journal tech writer who wrote a book on on essentially what it looks like for a product to to go from raw material all the way to being delivered to the end user. Hmm. And it's kind of fascinating if you're if any of this interests you and you want to get into the history, like deep, deep dive into the history of each step of the way, listen to it, read it. It's awesome. What's but that book called again, Ralph? Arriving Today by Christopher Mims. Okay. So one point that he mentioned, and it kind of struck a chord with me, is uh, some of the biggest, you know, people, the players in industry right now, Amazon is obviously at the top of everyone's list on on logistics and supply chain movement and things like that. But in their system, predictability is actually more important than speed. Hmm. Because you... There's a concept kind of in, I don't want to get too nerdy on like process improvement techniques that are out there, but there's something called statistical variation and dependent events. And that's a big piece of any process, which the supply chain just is a process. And that is, you know, there's variation in every human activity. Even if you're using computers, humans add variation. That It just mm, happens. Right. Even computers could have variation. Power could go out. There's variables that happen, and that's the statistical variation. And then every step after that is dependent on the sum total of all the variations that happened before it. And that pretty basic concept can be extrapolated to everything that we kind of talk about when it comes to processes, definitely the supply chain. But that's that's why it really made sense to me that predictability is more important than speed. If you can predict when something's going to happen, then you could have the next step of the process ready to do that part. And then if you can predict when that's going to happen, and it just mm. keeps going on and on and on through the chain of, yeah, of yeah. events that needs to happen. And if you have someone just that could sprint you know, a process that's just super fast, then it's just going to be sitting waiting with inventory of, of whatever that process is producing. And then the next step may or may not be able to handle all that. So then, and then that just starts to snowball down the supply chain or, mm-hmm. or the process steps. So it really made a lot of sense to me that, you know, predictability is really key in here. Obviously there's a minimum threshold of speed that you need, mm-hmm. but I say that because, you know, a big piece of our direct supply chain piece that we see uh, on the manufacturer distribution level, when something leaves the factory, when will it arrive in our warehouse in Pomona? That right. used to be very predictable. That right. used to be very easy. Not it was anymore. a 20, not anymore. <laughs> it was a 21 day trip. It would leave the port in China and arrive in the port of Long Beach in 21 days, maybe a day or two after if there's a storm or something like that. Very rarely. There are other issues. And then I would know within two to three days after that, it would arrive at the dock here in Pomona. I could predict because of the fact that the system had predictability built into it, that when we get an invoice from the factory within four weeks, the product would be at our doorstep in Pomona. And then knowing how long, you know, 
obviously there's variation on how long it would take for us to process product. We would know, yeah, we're right now we have a low amount of orders. We can get it on two days. Right now it's master order season. We, it could be up to three weeks because the volume of orders that come in and, you know, we're constantly shuffling uh, to hit the needs of the order and, and what our customers need. But that's what a supply chain look like. Yeah. Let's do and, this, Ralph. Let's say a tuba, you know, something that reps yep. do all the time. Uh, they, they, the sell tubas, deliver tubas. <clears throat> What is it? What does it start as, and then what steps does it have to go through to get to a dealer's warehouse? Sure. From start to finish, let's just go through step by step. So I think one thing to talk about is the fact that the modern factory is not what people picture in their mind when they see little drawings of factories, hmm. or you know, we've heard about the Henry Ford version of a factory where you see, you know, a pile of of raw steel, of iron ore, <laughs> right. you know, getting getting trained into a, a building and then smoke comes out of the building and then a car spits out the other end. <laughs> <laughs> That's actually what factories used to be. In many ways, the modern factory is almost, depending on what, what we're doing, um, Eastman's aren't because we do kind of do a lot more of the, of, the, of the manufacturing fabrication part of it. But a lot of times the modern factory is, in a, is the final assembly, really. Mm. Like a lot of the sub parts, the raw materials, they're done somewhere else. I, I, I actually pulled one example from the book. I think it it kind of plays into what we're going to go through with the life of a tuba, but okay. something much more complicated, a cell phone. The lithium used for cell phone, it, or that comes from Australia. The batteries are made in Korea. The microchips are made in Taiwan. The silicone for the microchips comes from Japan. The quartz come from Appalachia. The glass is manufactured in Kentucky. The sand <sighs> usually comes from Minnesota to make the glass. And the lasers that are in cell phones are from Texas. And that's just some of it. Well, All of that has to have its own little supply chain and then go to Foxconn in China to then assemble it and turn it into an Apple iPhone, for instance. Well. Yeah, <laughs> I didn't even lot. think about that. Yeah, when he said that, I was like, that's insane. Now, our supply chain is not that as complicated, but like we get sheets of brass. What it was before that, I don't know. You know, okay. we know copper what, we know what brass is. Copper and yeah, zinc. Yeah, copper and zinc somewhere. Right. And that gets formulated. into. Well, So we buy sheets of brass. We buy bar stock of metal. We, we buy all these raw materials. But there's parts that the factory sources out. You know, we're not making all of our screws from, mm -hmm. from stock. Mm -hmm. And and the factory production managers have to get all the raw materials and parts ordered. And that comes from different places. I could even say, you know, talking about the supply chain disruptions, we're making mouthpieces for Lasky up in Vancouver for Bakun. And they had a, an issue with being able to even source brass in the U.S. That has never mm -hmm. happened. Mm -hmm. So there's issues that are popping up at that level of where you just even get your raw materials. I know that we had struggles with cases last year. And that was because it was the, wherever in the world we get our, the, the factory gets plastic beads to melt and to make a mold for the case shell that had disruptions because of COVID restrictions or, or, or things like that. So, so the first step of raw materials, which is, used to be is Italy, is unpredictable, is delayed, <laughs> yeah, unpredictable. Okay. Right. So what's next? Um, so, so then we go into different steps for, so for a tuba, Someone's going to grab that sheet and cut it into the piece of, you know, for the bell, for example. They're going to grab that huge tuba bell, that huge piece of brass. They're going to cut out the shape of the bell. They're going to do some manipulation. You could go to our YouTube videos, um, mm -hmm. Eastman, and, and see. It's pretty amazing, pretty awesome. But yeah. they, they manipulate it. They turn that bell into, you know, that sheet of brass into a bell, do some really cool fire heat treating things. And then... You know, then there's someone who's going to grab the tube stock and cut them to length for the different various parts. They're going to bend. And so there's a lot of cool, hard metallurgical work that's happening. Yeah. Then it goes to a part of the factory where they're going to assemble it. And they're going to solder it together, use these jigs to make sure that your first valve is in the right place and the ports and all this stuff, all these words that mean things to brass players. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> so they make the tuba. They, they get it. They make, they assemble and make the tuba. Right. And then it gets put in a case and it gets put in the storage not too long because tubas, I'm sure if our dealers are listening, know that we have a large demand for tubas. <laughs> and right. pretty much once the factory makes it, they try to ship it. Right. So then the tuba factory sends two or three shipments a month to us, two or three containers a month, sometimes more. They will 
you know, schedule a container with a broker who then, you know, finds a spot on a boat. We don't own the containers. It's all rented. All this stuff is rented. Right. They, they put the tuba in a case. They put the case in the box. They pad it. And then they load it onto a container. So our factory uses 40-foot containers. They get the product. They put it on the boat. They send us an invoice. And then that is the trigger for us to know that it's on its way. Pre-pandemic, four weeks later, we could expect it to be in Pomona. Okay. And then when it gets to Pomona, we unload it. We do a quality control check. We add any, depending on the on the product and where we're at on the development of it. You know, we may have things that we add to it here, like specific types of lubricants or things like that. You know, as, as part of like the kind of the care package that mm-hmm. comes with your instrument, mouthpieces sometimes. Um, if it's a professional instrument, it's getting, a, you know, comes with upgraded shires or, or Alaska mouthpiece or whatever the case may be. And then we get an order. We package it. And then we work with our freight brokers to find the best rate to ship it to the dealer. The tube is going to go on a pallet, so that's definitely going to go on LTL, which is less than truckload, is is what it's called when you you know you piecemeal a shipment together, you one or two pallets to go on this in this truck mm-hmm. that's going to mm-hmm. go to a, a dealer somewhere on the other side of the country, and then even that you know arrives within pr- almost guaranteed pre pandemic. You know, four days. If it's four days, it's going to be there in four days. If it's three yeah. days, it's going to be there in three days. We yeah. you can almost, you know, very much rely on the predictability of it. So that's kind of like the process of getting a tuba and turning it into something that gets delivered to a dealer. Before we go on, let me see if I can summarize for, for the sake of myself and everybody listening, what the process is. So it's kind of fresh on their minds and then we'll go yeah. back through it and what's, what's, yeah. what's broken. So right. basically, basically you get the raw materials and the parts and the factory puts it all together, assembles it, makes, makes the pile, makes the instrument. The instrument then goes in a case into a box and that box is loaded into a container at the factory. That container then goes to the port that container goes on a boat, that boat goes across the ocean, then it gets unloaded once it gets to the other side of the ocean. That container then goes on to a truck that goes to our warehouse where we uh, do some finalization there at the warehouse. And then it goes on another truck to your store. Yes. That's the way it's supposed to work. Okay. <clears throat> so now you want to go into all the issues? Or? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> this is This is why we're even having this episode. Right. Um, I think that background helps kind of understand yeah. like what steps need to happen and, and the complexity of it. Even if you know when something's supposed to happen, it's still complex and there's still a lot of opportunities to make mistakes, which, yeah. you know, I'm not going to pretend like we haven't, but we've learned from them and we try to improve on them. And then we got to a point pre pandemic where I felt pretty darn confident that what the factory invoices us for is what we're going to get out of the box and that we know when it's going to arrive and that we could fulfill it for an order. Um, now that's broken. Yeah. It's, it's completely broken and it's not a hundred percent cause of COVID, but that's really what hmm. threw things in a tailspin. Right. Right. There's always been variation in the process ever since I started here and it's not predictable incidences, but it, there was always chance for the, the predictability to go away. Sure. In 2008, there was the the financial crash and fuel surcharges skyrocketed. So mm, that's right. You know, maybe it didn't maybe slow things down, but it definitely affected our our costing and our and our assumptions on what freight would cost us or our dealers, as we all live through and, and understand. Mm-hmm. There's been several strikes or, or threats of strikes by the longshoremen at the port of Los Angeles. Right. Uh, there was also chassis shortages. So the chassis is the thing that the containers go on. So if you're ever driving on the freeway, you look over, you see someone with a, a container on their truck, you'll notice there's there's like a, you know, a frame essentially mm-hmm. uh, that the container is loaded onto onto the truck and and sent off. So there's been shortages of chassis, but now the what really started this is this all started back in around 2018 and that is the fact that global demand of of consumer goods had started getting to a point to where the amount of containers themselves in the world wasn't really hitting demand. Hmm. Didn't have enough containers. There just weren't enough containers. And there's only a couple companies in China that make most of the containers for the world. And they 
you know, there's been an analysis of this done and they kind of predicted 2023, 24, they would catch up. So they weren't really insensitive. It's kind of like a duopoly. They didn't really have an incentive to increase production and lower their pricing and lower mm. their profits, right? They're fine. They're living in a, in a you know, high high demand, low supply world, which is where you will want to be. And they're there. So that's, that was one of the first issues that's been kind of happening. It's been brewing a bit hmm. over, over the last few years. And that, and that's, you know, an issue because then you could have lopsided containers. Obviously there's way more exports out of the Asian market to the U S than there is exports from the U S market to the Asian markets. Mm-hmm. So you end up with too many containers on our side and not enough where they need to be to get loaded for the next shipments that need to go out. So that's what you meant by lopsided containers. There are too yeah. many containers on one side of the ocean than the other. Right. So then, and mm-hmm. I know, you know, we return product to our factory. It's really cheap <laughs> to send product back. The, the, the freight cost is significantly less to send a container back because they're just trying to get containers back to where they're needed. Mm, um, right. and, 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 and I think something that us in the U.S., kind of fall to is that we think about everything US China, US China, US China. It's the entire Asian market. So the China's not the only manufacturer in the world right. place where things are manufactured. They're actually not the cheap option anymore. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. You can go to Indonesia, Vietnam, China factories are going to Indonesia, Vietnam to subsidize some of their manufacturing. Right. Um, and just India's- so we're clear, not Eastman's. Correct. Everything is done in our factories. Correct. <laughs> by Eastman employees. Yeah. But uh, India, you know, there's all these other players that are now starting to kind of become what China was, you know, 30, 40 years ago. And Japan right. was even before that. Um, but we got to think about Europe. You know, Europe consumption isn't that much less than the U.S. So there's a lot more going on than just the U.S. I didn't even talk about Africa. It's not like right. they don't buy anything. So there is a lot of, of things that are happening between the major ports in the U.S. already back in 2018. So that kind of sets the stage up for what happened during COVID. Obviously, we all know what happened in starting in December 2019, very rapidly becoming an issue in China that we at Eastman were obviously very conscious and aware of in, in some ways, you know, knew about it earlier than the general public in the U.S. Not like we had, you know, foresight to see what would happen in the U.S. Uh, from it, but we were very, very concerned with our factory workers mm-hmm. um, and, and the health and safety of them there. Yeah, our Eastman family over there. Yeah, exactly. Our coworkers. Um right. There was kind of a little bit of a, a hope because it happened during Chinese New Year. Uh, t- I'm sorry, I'm going to take another side here to explain Chinese New Year. That's another disruption in the supply chain here. Always, not just during COVID. The Lunar New Year, as celebrated in Asian um, cultures, is a very major event. It's like Christmas on steroids. Um, mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> the factory is shut down and it's affected essentially for six weeks plus. And that's not Eastman specific. That's across the board throughout, throughout China specifically. The whole continent. Exactly. Um, And it's hard. It's not as predictable. It's it's predictable because we know what the date is, but it's not the same every year. It's based off the lunar cycle. So it could be anywhere from mid January, I believe to late February. Mm -hmm. So it's going to affect us differently every year. But essentially what happens is, you know, there's the Chinese New Year actual date, the Lunar New Year date. And then a week before that and a week after that, we're shut down. There's no, it's it's a two-week holiday period for everyone. There's no office workers, no nothing. So that's a disruption that happens every year. Uh, specifically because of when COVID-19 outbreak happened in China, there was a lot of hope that that would help things. It, it obviously it didn't, but it, it really started the shutdown essentially Mm because the factory workers were not able to go back to work um, when they normally would have. And that's where we really started kind of panicking a little bit on our end, like, Oh, what's going on? You know, not even seeing what was going to happen a month later with the global shutdown that happened in March, not just Eastman, obviously all factories in, in Asia, all ports, everything was just shut down. And then you have the U S consumers bringing it back to our portion of the supply chain, Mm -hmm. we changed the way we purchased almost immediately, right? Right. We Um, got stuck at home. Got stuck at home, started buying on Amazon. Things started, you know, Amazon Prime started delivering in weeks 
you know, they were only going to just deliver diapers and non-essential items were going to take months. And there was this um, um, actually kind of amazing switch that happened in the domestic supply chain, the domestic distribution, wholesale warehouse fulfillment thing that we have here. Um, people started buying groceries, Instacart, all, all these completely different way, different mm-hmm. ways. And there was a lot of uncertainty in the world. And, it, and, and originally, everyone was very worried and, and buying essentials. And, you know, we all know about the panic buying. Right. The toilet paper shortage of 2020. Right. <laughs> right? Um, and, and and then so people started buying bidets. I mean, like it really happened, right? So then all of a sudden, Amazon has to worry about stocking and, and selling bidets where there's no source from it because the factories that probably make it in overseas are, are right? closed. Right. So you had all this like, stuff happening where people, you know, really depleted the shelves of, of all these distribution warehouses and stuff like that. Then, you know, we settled into the year and a half rut after that, that kind of we all have been living in where, you know, the factories eventually were able to open up again and, and start shipping product out again. And slowly but surely people started spending money differently because all of a sudden people didn't go on a summer vacation like they normally would have. They didn't go out to eat dinners for their anniversaries and, and birthdays and things like that. So right. that can US, add up to thousands of dollars between those two things alone, travel it and It absolutely can. And the people that could do that, and not, let's not pretend like everyone made it out of COVID so far, you know, unscathed. There was, you know, so many, so much tragedy that happened in the world. There's so many people that lost their jobs. Right. You know, there's a lot of furloughs that happened. There's obviously a lot of stuff that didn't go right. But right. for a bulk of the middle class income, uh, Americans, there was money. There was cert, you know, there was surplus of money because they didn't spend money on things. They were able to work from home if they were lucky enough to. And there was also government stimulus checks that arrived. So they're right. all, all of a sudden their bank accounts are growing. And especially at that range of income level, they don't, you don't usually grow, right? It's kind of like the paycheck to paycheck people that are still living well. Mm-hmm. Now all of a sudden they're not really paycheck to paycheck because they're realizing they're not spending money on things they, they would have normally spent. So all of a sudden let's, let's, let's do that remodel in the kitchen. Let's buy the new refrigerators. Let's buy the new sofas, TVs, everything. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Webcams, you know, not, not just for fun, but out of necessity, because now you're working at home. Uh, Your kids are driving you crazy. So you're going to buy the Nintendo switch and and have them play video games. And there's Mm -hmm. so Mm -hmm. much things that change in the consumer spending, the consumer demand for goods all goods across the board where normally we would have spent them on services like restaurants and, and, and experiences from going on vacation and things like that. Right. So they bought stuff instead of experiences, right? Lots and lots of stuff. So then all of a sudden the factories in Asia that were shut down, start opening up and they get this explosion of demand that didn't exist before. So they're scrambling to get as much done as they can while having to deal with the supply chain issues from random uh, shutdowns um, that happen throughout Asia. All of a sudden, the port at Vietnam is shut down because there's a COVID outbreak. Well, mm-hmm. the container ship that needs to leave from the port in China on that particular line has to go by Vietnam or vice versa. It goes from Vietnam to, to China. It can't. So now that's delayed. So that's where we lost all of our predictability. Mm-hmm. The 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 journey that all these pieces would have normally gone to are intermittently disrupted throughout this whole process. Again, while there's a unprecedented amount of demand for consumer goods in the United States mm-hmm. and Europe, not just the U.S. No. Right. So that's that's still kind of in many ways where we are today. Going back to the book again, <laughs> I really it's a good book. Um, a really good point they made is. You, thinking about these fulfillment centers, these Amazon fulfillment centers, UPS, FedEx, all, all these places that kind of like before that last truck gets the product to be delivered, um, they basically went from percentage wise their busiest days of the year, which traditionally are leading up to Christmas, mm-hmm. to that. That's their new, I hate saying this term because it's cliche, that's their new normal. That is their normal day. They every day is like op- Christmas. Every day is like Christmas. Wow. Because the United States consumer has increased their consumption of goods by 30%. Wow. That's a lot. So, yeah. 
so I mean, that's like, uh, you know, we're talking to ad reps here. We're talking to music store people. That's like having rental season every day. Right. <laughs> like having that line out your door every day and it's not lighting up. And that's what's happening in, in the supply chain in the, in the U.S. right now. And it, it's happening everywhere. So now we have this incredible pent up demand and, and the Asian market's delivering and there's a monumental amount of ships and containers on their way all to go to almost one place in the U.S. And that's the joint ports of Los Angeles and um, Long Beach in the San Pedro Harbor. And many news articles have been printed about that place and this issue you're talking about. Because that's where everything's going. We ended up with this enormous backlog of container ships that you've seen, everyone's seen pictures of on the on the news where you see it, a parking lot of these massive container ships that are literally the size of a, a high-rise building wow. holding tens of thousands of containers that need to be unloaded where that would normally just show up, get to the dock, unload their stuff and turn back. You know, it would just be a, a couple day turnaround. Now they're sitting there for a month plus mm. wow. parked. You, just and waiting. Just waiting. My heart goes out for the workers on them because they, they can't get off because right, of COVID stuck. restrictions. Right. You know, some, some of these port work, not port workers, the, the boat workers, the boat staff are, have been stuck on their ships for a year. Can you imagine? They, I can't. <laughs> I can't. <laughs> no, normally, stuck in those boats. Normally, yeah. Normally they they dock and they'd get out of the boat and go to like a area that they have there for the boat workers to, you know, get something to eat or something, I guess, and then get back on. Or if the boat's going to be there a while, they can, I don't know, get out of the area, take a cab somewhere, but get, and none of that. Get off the no, boat. <laughs> exactly. They can't because wow. of COVID restrictions right Crazy. now. So that's, that's, that's what's happening. That type of stuff is happening. It's happening to truck drivers, uh, Amazon workers, UPS workers, FedEx workers. They're just working at peak capacity every single day. Yeah. It's just a giant um, bottleneck there, right? You just have too many boats coming in and just you can only unload them so fast. And, and it's not, and one of the major reasons why we need predictability through all of this is because these aren't connected. This isn't a connected network. The the network in China is not connected to the ports of Los Angeles. So the ports of Los Angeles have to find out when the boats are coming. I mean, they know, you know, but it's not one system. And then the ports in Los Angeles don't aren't plugged into whatever, you know, the the, the train companies that are going to take some of these. That It's all separate systems that they talk to manually. So there's there there none of the infrastructure was ready to or or prepared to deal with the massive amount of product that did come in, mm. and then you have these boats that are already a month late getting back on their schedule. So talked about predictability being out the window. Then they have to go back to China to get the product that's waiting for them to get back on the boat because demand hasn't changed, and they're in such a rush they're not taking all the containers back with them. They're going back underloaded hmm. because they're trying to hit a deadline rather than wait another couple of days to, for the containers to come back because they're stuck somewhere right. else because there's not enough delivery drivers to, you know, it, it, it's just such a huge snowball that happened. So, so once that container actually gets unloaded in the port, there's another issue it, it yes. kind of hits, right? That's the trucking yes. industry. Right. So, and, and there's different pieces of the trucking industry. There's the trucks that arrive at the port with the chassis to, you know, they get a delivery window, a pickup window. They do have like a, a, a computerized system. The, uh, the, the company that we use um, has information on when they can go and they get an appointment schedule. They're showing up and having to wait six, eight hours mm. when it was normally under an hour. Um, they're waiting in line with the other trucks. And sometimes they missed their pickup window. And, and the port says, sorry, we can't get your container now because you took so long Come because the tomorrow. line to get it so long. Yes, <laughs> that actually has happened to our truck driver. I feel terrible for him. The, the, the company that we use, we talk to him about it and, and he tells us, he shows us pictures of what it looks like. Wow. It's insane. He's sitting in a parking lot. In the before time, <laughs> we, we were able to sometimes get two containers, even three containers delivered from the same truck driver. But yes, the, the actual trucking industry itself has really been hurt with COVID. Mm -hmm. Partially for the same reason everyone else has because of restrictions and unfortunate illnesses and, and things like that. 
But also, it, it's this isn't new, and this has been happening as well. The trucking industry, it's it's been going through a lot of issues with the fact that most of of the truckers are starting to age out, mm-hmm. and there's not a lot of people interested in doing that job when they have college degrees. It is a hard job, and it doesn't pay that well. So there's there's this constant idea that there's a shortage of truck drivers. There's not really actually a shortage of truck drivers. There is kind of a bit now because of of COVID. But an interesting fact, again, from the book was that one in three truck drivers quit after the first 90 days on the job. And that's a normal thing all the that's, time. That's, that's, that's not normal that's pre-COVID. Over. That's normal. Oh, and okay. it's not like you can just go out and be a truck driver tomorrow. You have right. to go to school and, and sometimes they pay you to train you. But that's an incredible amount of turnover. So in many right. ways, this this shortage of truckers is just a shortage of people that stay hmm. and, and want to do the job. I can't remember what the other statistic was, but the amount of people that have class A's driver's license versus truckers is you would never expect that. You know, truck class A means you could drive a, a, a semi truck, and I, you would never expect there to be that much more people with the license than people with the actual job. Interesting. Yeah. So, so that's a big piece of the puzzle, a big problem. Um, and, and, and it is also COVID restrictions and the amount of people that you can have working next to each other and things like that. So, you know, we have our LTL freight partners that we use and they're not able to deliver, uh, the same level of service to be quite honest that they were pre COVID because of these, you know, I'm, I'm sure there were a lot of truckers who are like, I guess I'm done now. I'm not, I'm not dealing with this anymore. I'm at retirement age. So I'm, mm-hmm. I'm, I'm done. Um, and, and, you know, obviously there were a lot of people warehouse work, which a lot of trucking work actually kind of is like to get the product to the trucks and get right. and, and the logistics of, you know, taking our pallets that we sent to them to a distribution hub to go onto the right truck. That's going to then go to a, a hub in Philadelphia or something like that. So there is a, just a shortage of workers kind of support work it, in the trucking industry, as well as truckers themselves, right? Um, and I've seen I've seen uh, you know shipments for for dealers sit in these hubs for two weeks because they just don't have enough people to sort the boxes around to go on the trucks that are actually going out to the or untrained people are, right? making mistakes and errors. Right? I, I I know you and I specifically have worked on <laughs> or discussed. Um, yeah. <laughs> you know you've been vocal about some of these disappointments. We'll call it, but <laughs> but you know it it. it I hate saying it is what it is, but that's that's the situation that we're living with right now. It is. And and it's the time where everyone just needs to I think understand this is a complex issue that no one person in the world can even pretend to even fully grasp from start to finish, but let alone actually do something about it in the time frame that everyone's demanding right now. So it's just the time to be patient. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> And basically, going back to that tuba we were talking about, from the moment it's done to the moment it arrives at your store, every last step is delayed, is taking longer, and it's unpredictable. Correct. So the, the big question, Ralph, that I'm sure ed reps are, are asking right now is, how long is this going to go on? Hmm. I think if anyone could answer that question with any certainty, they'd they'd probably be pretty well off. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> but I I can give you what my prediction is, and that's based off of the obviously I've done some research and and educating myself in this situation be, over, with what's happened over the past two years. Uh, my prediction, I would say, we won't feel a sense of normalcy until after Chinese New Year break 2023. So I think we're living with some level of this unpredictability for another year. So another big question is how do how do ed reps and how do we as manufacturers help teachers plan better so that when they need this tuba they'll get this tuba. How do they how do they do this? How do they plan? So I could say a little bit of what, what Eastman did. We decided to not back up um, or, or delay any manufacturing, and we kept the gas, so to speak, at, at full blast. We kept the factory making products. So we said either we 
back up in fear that the world just broke and COVID's the end of civilization as we know it. <laughs> right. Or we gamble that we can make this stuff. Worst case, we have inventory that we didn't need, but let's keep our factory workers working and employed. Let's give them orders we would normally give them. And hopefully we'll be able to support our dealers and ultimately the teachers and, and the musicians out there by having product for them to to be able to use for with how they need it, when they need it. Mm-hmm. Uh, it paid off, I think, for sure. Certainly. Because... We had things on the shelf to to sell when, when somebody needed it. Mm-hmm. And we were able to use some of our other kind of cool technology things to even communicate that better, what we did have on the shelf and, and things like that. Mm-hmm. And and so that that's what we did. And you know, it took the, the guts <laughs> of, of our owner, Chen, to say, no, we're going to do this. And I, I'd rather I'd rather gamble now and pay later than pay now and, and never be able to recover. Right. Um, so so we did it and it worked. I, I don't think we're headed. You know, we see the numbers plummeting for the coronavirus right now that no one could predict the future. We don't know what the next variation of this is or anything like that. But I think if you operate like things are going to be OK and that there will be some, especially now, it was a lot harder last year since we're talking about schools for the most part and, and when they can actually have children play. But I, I live in Los Angeles area. California is obviously one of the most restricted places in the country. Mm-hmm. My wife's actually a middle school uh, band director and orchestra teacher. So I I have kind of firsthand knowledge on on what it's like for her to have to deal with this type of stuff. But even, even here where we are, she's able to play and she's able to have her kids um, play the instrument. They have to play outside, but she's able to do it. So she still has her needs. She still has instruments she needs. She still has reads that she needs. She still has all these things that she needs. So what I had advised her to do and some of her coworkers, and they kind of did it was pretend like you still need what you need and, and where you would normally schedule out. If you even do schedule out on, on that might get a chuckle from from the ed reps about whether or not the teachers are actually scheduling out what they need. Planning but ahead. You, yeah. yeah, but you could predict for them what they needed based off of previous years and what they what they purchased. Mm-hmm. Try to get them to to think of a cycle before that. You know, if you could just get a, a cycle ahead, because we all know. If I, I think I say if I say cycle, I think everyone knows what that means. You know, you have your own cycle for your district. Schools go back in August, September, wherever that is, and then right. there's concert you know there's marching band cycle there's then transitions to concert band kids start buying step ups and there's rental you know all these cycles that happens if you could get teachers to plan a cycle ahead and if or even more so if you can do that for them you can say hey this is what you usually need lead times are an extra 2 to 3 months than normal right now mm-hmm. so let's think back 2 to 3 more months and let's get a 6 month plan in front of you instead of a 2 month plan hmm. so you're basically plan. you're basically saying plan for next year right now. Yes. Yep. That would be where we're at with the current cycle that we're in right now. Yes. Mm-hmm. That makes sense. And yeah, I could see ed reps playing a huge role because teachers don't necessarily think that far in advance. They have concerts and they have lessons and they have all sorts of busyness that kind of consume their lives, honestly. Right. And it could be a huge benefit for an ed rep to step in and educate them on all these things we're talking about and why they need to plan for next year now. Right. And, and in, in many ways, it's what we've done with, you know, our sales staff, uh, quite honestly, within Eastman, where I provide information you do. for our sales staff to do the same thing, to be able to say, hey, dealer, this is what you bought last year. I think it's actually time to talk about next year because we, the world's unpredictable right now. Our supply chain is unpredictable right now. So we don't know when we're going to be able to get you all this stuff. But we're, if we can get you in line now with low risk, then you'll be, we'll be able to deliver. If we don't do that, I can't guarantee anything. Hmm. And in the same way, if you can, within your own system, see what a school has purchased or a teacher or however you you track their accounts and kind of go to them and say, this is what a normal year looks like. And normally you call me two weeks before you need something. Let's look at moving that to six months <laughs> right? <laughs> because right. we know from the manufacturer for all these reasons that I've kind of vomited out in this podcast, <laughs> <laughs> what, what, what the situation and the landscape of the world looks like. And I think people are listening. They understand that, you know, we all have anecdotes about, you know, people who, who don't have a refrigerator because it's late. Right. Um, you know, someone's trying to do a home improvement project and they can't get the cabinets or, or 
Or they look for a bike a, for their kid. Exactly. We've all been on Amazon yeah. within the last two years and said, what? <laughs> Six months. <laughs> you know, and it's no one's fault, you know, and all you can do is plan. And again, yeah. I think I think what you could do is try to help your your teacher, your customers to, to predict what they're going to need based off of history pre-2020. So you know, to that point, when I give our sales staff numbers, I don't give them numbers off of last year or the two years. We expanded it to the last five years because we got to get to what's relevant to what we, we are optimistic that's going to happen in the future. Yeah. Well, it sounds like uh, a meeting specifically with each of your teachers to go over the the plans for the next year would be really helpful. And honestly, take some of the stress off of next year. If you know you need, a, again, a two by next year, you know, start talking about it now. Don't talk about it two mm -hmm. weeks before they need it because it won't happen. They won't get it. <laughs> they won't. They, they won't. And, and in many ways, you know, because the demand is higher. So, so us manufacturers are scrambling to increase our production. So even there's so, there's so many variables and no guarantees right now due to unpredictability of what's, what we have before us, that the more they can get in line and get part of that conversation, the more likely we can, we can deliver. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, we're talking as if everything that we make is out of stock. It's not. And, and, no. and for all vendors, for all manufacturers of, of all kinds, you know, manufacturers do have things on their shelves. So as an ed rep, one of the best things I think you could do is call your manufacturer rep, call your, uh, your rep that, that uh, services your store and ask them about availability. And we're yep. always happy. I, I do this on a daily basis and probably more now than I've ever done as, as a, a sales director at Eastman. Every day I'm looking up ETAs and, and helping people plan for when, uh, when teachers should get things. And as an ed rep, have your vendors on your phone, speed dial and talk to them because they will be able to provide the best information in, in a short amount of time. So once you have these meetings with your teachers, call your vendors and ask them about the things that these teachers are asking for and have a realistic window of time so that you can relay that to your teachers. A, a, a phrase that I use all the time is managing expectations. And it's so important right now with your customers from us, from, from Eastman to our dealers, and then from, you know, an ed rep to your teachers, managing their expectations. If they know it's going to take eight months, they won't get stressed out. I mean, I mean, they, they, they know it's going to take eight months. They, they're not surprised by it when it comes eight months later. If they have no idea and they think it's going to be here in three weeks, but it's going to take three months, that's when they get upset. I mean, that's when it can strain relationships. Anything else on, on that, Ralph? No, I exactly. And, and and obviously it's not news to anyone that we're dealing with. For the most part, the end of June is obviously, you know, the huge timeline that we have to hit. So right now we're already at, at halfway through February. So if they want something this year, they probably need to order it now because mm -hmm. they've got three months before we we can't deliver, um, and and because of the the nature of the beast right now, that's where we're at because the container does take an extra month or more to arrive. Mm -hmm. So what you're saying is, as soon as uh, you're done listening to this this episode, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> talk to your teachers <laughs> immediately <laughs> about right. if you need something for the school year or or, or even early next school year. Yeah if, yeah, if you need it to, for the beginning of your program, you're going to need to get, order it right now. Yeah, yeah, yep. get on it. <laughs> yep, yep. Well, hopefully it doesn't take too much longer for the log jam of, of the supply chain to break and things to flow again. But I think as long as we're all communicating clearly and ed reps, you're talking to your vendors and there's always a, a flow of information instead of wondering and guessing, uh, things will go a little smoother until, until that log jam breaks. Anything else, Ralph? Any words of wisdom out there to help ed reps, uh, I guess, manage those expectations with, with teachers? No, I mean, obviously, this is far too much information to talk to anyone about, probably. <laughs> and I hope I, I hope I haven't bored anyone with any of this. But I think at the end of the day, it's just about communicating that what we used to be able to predict, we can't predict anymore. So the best we can do is plan ahead another cycle or two, whatever you're comfortable with. The more ahead of it you can get, the better and happier you'll be with delivery. And we're here to work as partners to, to try and get there.
it's the message that I give to our sales staff and, and, and our customers. It's I feel the same message that ed reps can give to their teachers. And if they want to know the reasons why, hopefully I've given you more than enough ammo, uh, so to speak, to, to explain and, and answer any of the questions that may pop up. Good stuff, Ralph. We appreciate all this information. We all know now way more than we ever thought we would need to about a supply chain. But given that it's one of the biggest challenges that we face as an industry, well, like we're all in the same boat, right? We're in the same boat. <laughs> that's and that boat is at the port. <laughs> that's, that's the and problem. And it's we're uh, all waiting in to be it. unloaded. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. And that's probably a better way to say it than predictability. <laughs> yeah. Well, thanks again, Ralph. And if uh, if anybody has any questions about these things, call your vendors. Really, yep. Communicate with them. Ask them questions. Communicate as much as you can. And honestly, if anyone has any questions specifically and, and wants any more information, they can email me directly. How would they do that? R Torres T O double R E S at Eastmanstrings dot com. Awesome. Thanks again for your time, Ralph. Thank you, Shane. We hope you found the information in this episode useful and something you can use in your everyday life as an ed rep. If there is a topic you'd like to learn more about and have presented on a future episode of Ed Rep Radio, or would you like to give us some feedback in general, please email us at edrepradio at eastmanstrings.com. To learn more about Eastman Music Company, go to our website, eastmanmusiccompany.com, or give your Eastman rep a call. Thanks, and drive safe.